Okay, so springs are something we normally don't cover until chapter 10 or until later, until we talk about something about simple harmonic motion. But um, they're useful throughout uh, all of what we call mechanics, forces, motion, and everything. So, and it's not a difficult concept. Springs, the basic idea is this, is when you try to take a spring and stretch it, so to uh, start with um, some spring that might look like, let's see, a hook and then, oops, a pen here. So some spring that might have a little hook at the end and then start off with the coils fairly close together. And if you grab one end of that spring, so you attach this end here to something, and you stretch it, you pull it, it might look like that. Well, pulling it, this the first couple centimeters, isn't nearly as hard as if pulling it these last couple centimeters, for example. Because with a spring or a rubber band, the farther it's stretched, think about what this means, the harder it becomes to stretch more. So in other words, the force varies with the distance that you stretch it. So if you only pull it this short distance, the force that you're experiencing to do that, the force to do that is going to be less than if you stretch it this larger distance. By the time you get out to here, the force you're going to be having to hold it with to keep it from snapping back is going to have to be even larger. This makes sense. You're going to smack somebody with a rubber band, right? Nobody gets afraid if you pull it back like a quarter of an inch. But if you pull it back, you know, as far as it'll go, so to speak, you know there's a lot of force required to pull it back. You know when it's let go, it'll turn that for that stored energy into kinetic energy. It'll hurt even more. So this idea that the force that the spring is pulling, Newton's third law, by the way, if you're pulling on the spring this way, the spring is pulling on you the other way, equal and opposite. The force that that spring produce, produces, or the force you need to stretch it, depends on distance. Okay, so that's the first thing it depends on. So we know the force by a spring is going to depend on the distance x, that you stretch it away from its equilibrium position. So this, for example, would be its equilibrium position for that, All right, this relaxed, unstretched state. And by the way, it also goes for a spring that you would compress. For example, think of a spring like the kind you have inside of a ballpoint pen. It starts like this, and this might be its equilibrium position. It's at rest. It's no big deal. It's not you know, compressed or anything. And then you push on it with a certain force, and you smash it down a certain distance x. Once again, to continue to smash it further is going to take even more force. So that force that the spring pushes back with, or that you need to use to push the spring, depends on the distance. But it depends on something else as well. No two springs are created equal. Um, if you've ever looked underneath of a car or a truck, you've seen these enormous iron springs. They're so large and stiff that you would have a hard time imagining you know, what it would take to compress these things. Whereas if you consider the spring that we just mentioned, the one in the ballpoint pen, those are easy to compress. So some springs are very stiff and difficult to compress or stretch. Others are easily stretched and compressed. Every spring has this stiffness number associated with it. How much force you might get if you compressed it a meter. Now the meter is just the unit that we use. Obviously many springs, you can't even compress them or stretch them more than a meter. But it's the force per meter the stiffness, or, this, or what we call the spring constant, K. So this number represents, it depends on the spring. This is called the spring constant. And every type of spring has its own spring constant. And it is, the units are newtons per meter. Which would make sense, because this is a distance, and in physics would be given in meters. 
So when you multiply them, you end up with newtons, because the meters would cancel. And that would make sense, because that's a force. It should be in newtons. So the x, remember, is the distance stretched or compressed from its equilibrium position, its natural you know, position. So a spring, for example, that is hung from the ceiling, nothing on it. Technically, we're going to ignore the weight of the spring. Um, this would be its equilibrium position. You attach a weight to it of some kind, a mass to it, and it will stretch out from that e a certain distance, x, from that equilibrium position. Well, if you think about it, then that means if it just sits here, right? If we just if what we're looking at here is I'm going to use the word in equilibrium, but it is different than what, I, than what I'm saying over here. It is this whole thing, the net force on it will be zero if it's just sitting there. So in this case, if you drew a free body diagram for this mass, draw a dot, you'd have the weight of that mass, mg, pulling downward, and you'd have the force by the spring upward. And that force, of course, would be k times x. Of course, we need to know the spring constant and the distance. Or what if we knew the weight and I knew the distance it was stretched, x, I could find the spring constant simply by just hanging a mass on it and saying, well, if it's in equilibrium, the spring force has to be equal in magnitude to the weight. So the spring constant would be the weight divided by the distance it stretched. There is one other thing that shows up when you do your reading on springs, and, and that is there's a negative right here, generally. And what that means is this. This is the force by the spring. This x is really a displacement. So it would be positive or negative. So here's, what we, here's where the negative comes into play in the formula. So if I start with an object attached to a spring, here's my spring. And I take that object, attach the spring, that mass, and I pull out to here. So now, we'll use this as a second diagram. So, so later on, I stretch that spring out to here. I really don't even need the mass, to be honest with you, but we'll just do it. I moved that a distance or a displacement that is positive, because we're going to assume left to right is positive. So it was here, it went to here, right? It went out that far, that would be a positive value. Which way would the spring be pulling on this mass down here at this moment? It'd be pulling the other way, wouldn't it? So that's why it's always, the, the force is always going to be the opposite direction that you stretch to the spring. That's why this formula comes with its own negative. That because it's a directional thing. The force by a spring will always be in the opposite direction from the displacement. Well, of course, k is always going to be positive. But this value could be positive or negative. So if I looked at the whole thing like this, same situation, I took that spring and I stretched it out to this direction. So let's say this is equilibrium position for it, where the spring is relaxed, and I went out to here. This distance or displacement would be negative because it went to the left. Which way would the spring be pulling? Well, that way, which is positive. So it's always going to be opposite signs, which is all that's telling us. For the most part, in many situations, we're only worried with what we call the magnitude. And so the negative positiveness of the size of this force really doesn't make much of a difference to us. So the key is, for springs, one of the things you'll need to know is that force is going to depend on the k, the spring constant and the distance it is pulled or compressed. And I think that's good for now.